Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeremy Jurgens, a managing director at the World Economic Forum, and I'd like to thank all the journalists that are uh, joining us here for this session uh, this morning. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Julie Sweet uh, from the um, CEO and chair at Accenture, Jurgen Stock, Secretary General, Interpol, Nikesh Aurora, Chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks, and Eddie Rama, Prime Minister of Albania. Thank you. So we're here today to share the findings of the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Security Outlook uh, Report 2023. This is a result of uh, research in collaboration with the forum's communities and our partner Accenture, which we've uh, interviewed and sought input from over 300 executives globally. There's a few headlines that are worth uh, sharing and pointing out that emerge from this research. First, it's around geopolitics. The most striking finding that we found is that 93% of cyber leaders and 86% of cyber business leaders believe that the geopolitical instability makes a catastrophic cyber event likely in the next two years. This far exceeds anything that we've seen in previous surveys. Now, the concern goes beyond politically motivated cyber attacks. And I'm sure Prime Minister Rama will be able to give us more information on that uh, later on and how these can be dealt with. And we see with the increasing digitalization in the world, this as well increases the interconnections that we have across various services. It also makes it more difficult to find the experts that we need to address the cyber challenges that are in front of us. As well, cyber attacks can spread unpredictably. We saw this in the case of the Viasat attack that was done on Ukraine, which uh, was initially intended to shut down communication services for the Ukrainian military, but as well closed off parts of electricity production across Europe. So the unintended consequences there. And the geopolitical fragmentation that we're seeing globally makes collaboration across borders and responses much more difficult in the case of a cyber event. Now there is well some positive developments and I'd like to highlight two specifically. First is around investment. Business leaders increasingly see cybersecurity as part of their strategic investment plan with 49% of business executives saying that cybersecurity fed into decisions on the countries that they would invest in. Again, this is something that we haven't seen before making investment decisions based on the cybersecurity footprint. Second, uh, there's increased interactions. Business leaders are increasingly bringing their cyber professionals into boardroom discussions and meeting them with them on a regular basis. 56% of security leaders now meet monthly or more frequently with their board and this will help narrow the gap of the understanding between the business leaders and the cyber professionals. Now we do see a few challenges in front of us. One, how do we assess the practical impact of cyber risk? While boards have prioritized cybersecurity, we see that it's still a challenge for boards to assess the uh, value that they get from cyber investments and how to actually take the uh, recommendations and translate that into actual business operations and business strategy. Second, there's a significant cyber skills shortage. We're a long way from having the cybersecurity professionals that we need. 34% of respondents shared that they have skills gaps in their teams and 14% said they lack specific critical skills needed to protect their organizations. We've seen in other work that the forum does that there's opportunities here for reskilling and bringing in people who haven't necessarily studied cybersecurity or computer science before and also bringing in underrepresented communities as the organizational skills needed in cybersecurity are as important as the technical ones. Now with this, I'd like to actually go over to Julie for our first question. And Julie, how should business leaders think about cybersecurity and what actionable next steps would you recommend? Great, well I think it's important for business leaders to focus on three numbers, 86, 43, 27. 
86% of business leaders, as Jeremy mentioned, believe there will be a catastrophic cyber event in the next two years. 43% of them believe it will have a material impact on their own business, a very significant number. And only 27% of business leaders believe they're cyber resilient. And so the gap between cyber resilient companies and the likelihood of a material catastrophic event is significant. This is a burning platform and we do see that both with the level of investment and also the shifting questions of how you move to more actionable steps. And so we suggest three. First, secure the core. What does that mean? You actually have to, in a world where the world has moved online and all strategies lead to technology, the security aspect of technology needs to be built in. It's not easy because technology is not simply running the corporate. It's not about email. It's now in the core of the business, whether it's how you're doing exploration in oil and gas, how you're communicating between providers and payers and health, and the list goes on. And so using clear assessments about whether all technology is secure is absolutely vital, along with consistency. These are not uh, debates about whether or not you should empower leaders to decide which security tools. Unfortunately, that's not how it's been working. So secure the core. The second is address the talent challenge. That needs to be done in two ways. The first way is actually more technology. Much of what's done by security professionals today with proper technology can actually be automated with better outcomes so that humans can focus on more of the intel, the human behavioral changes, and learning about the actual business risks and what's needed. That leads to the aspect of training. And the talent is needs to have training. There are not enough people in the world with cyber skills. There's, according to our research, over 2 million people with a gap. And so training is absolutely critical. The good news, you do not have to create this training on your own. And there's lots of ways you can collaborate with other organizations. The third actionable step is a shift in mindset and culture at the C-suite where cyber resilience equals business resilience. What does that mean? Well, very practical step. Every month when I review with my top leaders our business results, we review whether or not we had any cyber incidents. It's a concrete change that we made to be clear that cyber is the same as financial performance. And so thinking about your own culture, your own processes, what has to change so that your entire C-suite understands cyber resilience equals business resilience. Those are the three actionable steps that every company can take tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julie. You're going to move in over to you. Uh, the Outlook suggests that the nature of cyber threats is changing. From where you what you see, what does this mean for cooperation to fight uh, cybercrime? Yeah, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Indeed, the impact of cyber threats and cybercrime on international security is increasingly severe because it is increasingly complex. So one of the, the key terms here is uh, cybercrime as a service, where everyone in the underground economy is able to purchase or rent the necessary tools to conduct a, a cyber attack. And as we know, there is not a single country, not a single region, not a single company that can tackle the threat on its own. It really requires cooperation, and that is exactly what the World Economic Forum is about. This is a, a global threat. Not a surprise. Uh, it calls for a global response and it calls for enhanced and coordinated action. We are in law enforcement, uh, in ourselves, we are dealing with the problem of fragmentation because there are so many actors, which on the one hand is positive, on the other hand, it not only leads to duplication, but it also risks that relevant information in connecting the dots and identifying criminal networks who are exploiting. IT, um, IT systems uh, are not being dismantled and we are not able to provide as Interpol investigative leads to our member country's police service. A recent survey conducted by Interpol last year has shown that cybercrime remains a top, top priority all around the world in all Interpol regions and we are bringing 195 member countries together 
and it's definitely also a top priority for Interpol. The complexity of cybercrime is compounded, and just to illustrate one or two of the problems, by the silence of victims. So we know too often victims remain silent for a number of reasons, including a reluctance to reveal a vulnerability and negatively perhaps um, affect the reputation, perhaps, for instance, uh, of a, com a company. So either you are private citizens or you are a company, you are considering various elements whether you should report to the police uh, or not. There is perhaps a lack of a clear anonymized reporting mechanism for victims to alert their service providers or law enforcement. And we can only take action if we are provided with the necessary information, which in today's world, of course, regularly sits within the private sector. We also know that data on attacks can remain in silos in national law enforcement agencies uh, and industry incident response teams, either because there is a lack of a kind of exchange channel across sectors or because they are on to the next crisis. And we are discussing here in Davos the phenomenon of poly crisis. So the C-suites are dealing currently with a lot of crisis uh, in parallel. And we know that industry experts may not be aware of who to contact in law enforcement, for instance, um, to safely provide sensitive information that can be the beginning of a successful police operation to get the cyber criminals behind bars. There is also a sense that cyber crime and cyber enabled crime is too complex and that the chance of getting any investigative results is too low. Hence, sharing data is sometimes seen as pointless. I think a lot of success story we are having, also based on the cooperation here with the Center for Cybersecurity, our close collaboration with the private sector has been indicating we, we, we are, we can be successful if we are provided with the necessary um, information. So a case in point was the recent Interpol coordinated operation which mobilized law enforcement in 14 countries, which illustrates the dimension of cyber operations across four continents in a targeted strike against um, a group that is called Black X and related West African organized crime groups, currently here in the media, also in Switzerland. The operation resulted in 75 arrests, a further 70 suspects identified, and more than 1 million euros intercepted in bank accounts through our anti-money laundering rapid response protocol. And that illustrates the link between cybercrime and financial crime and money laundering. In fact, in 2022 alone, Interpol helped our member countries intercept nearly 200 million euros in criminal proceeds. That's on the one hand a success. On the other hand, if we, if we see the, the huge profits that cyber criminals are making, it's still, it must be an encouragement for all of us, including the private sector, politicians, law enforcement, to do much more. The key to winning the battle against cybercrime, if I may phrase it like this, is of course to work together to make it a priority across the geopolitical fault lines and with stronger platforms that encourage public-private sector cooperation, like the platform that the World Economic is providing and connecting with Interpol that represents global um, law enforcement. The Cybercrime Atlas initiative is a step absolutely in the, into the right direction, absolutely necessary, encouraging also private industry to do more to anticipate and mitigate the threats because it's a very dynamic situation. The criminals are investing their huge profits into new tools, into their sophisticated tools, and we have to make sure that we keep pace, but also that we are further developing the global architecture of security because I repeat myself, it's a global threat like other global threats that are currently discussed here, and only if we are building the bridges between the silos that still exist specifically between law enforcement and the private sector, moderated also by the World Economic Forum, we can be more successful. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, Nikesh, we uh, saw in the report the rise in awareness uh, of, of the risks here, and also the comments from Jürgen, the financial implications of this. And uh, there's this tendency for CISOs to always ask for more investment. So how should how should leaders think about assessing their investments and getting the most uh, return from the cyber investments they make? Well, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, look, the report is encouraging. It's encouraging because uh, we have accumulated a lot of cyber debt 
over the last few decades where we have underinvested in cybersecurity because we honestly never expected all of our technology and systems to be interconnected around the world. As Julie highlighted, everything is connected pretty much. It is the technology is the core of your business. And we have not invested in cyber because the returns, to your point, have not been understandable and the threat has not been as visible as it has been recently. So it's encouraging to see in the report that C-level executives, board members, senior leaders are aware that there is a problem. Uh, this, the, the sort of part we have to work on collectively is nobody seems comfortable that they have it under control. And uh, I don't think this uh, cyber debt that has been created goes away in a short period of time. I don't think the reliance on technology is going to go down anytime soon. I expect more businesses will spend more time, effort, energy, and make technology core of their enterprise. Uh, I think towards that end, it's important to both understand the business risk and treat it in a way like you treat every other risk, is what is my ability to recover from that risk and how secure do I feel? Which highlights some of the things with Julie highlighted again, which says, go back and invest in your core technology. Make sure that you understand that every part of your business is secure. Make sure that you are leveraging the industry as well as public-private partnerships to understand that when you end up in a scenario where you need to go create some remediation, that you have all the I's dotted and T's crossed and you're sharing your data early, so when it comes down to remediate, you are in a position to go and remedy the problem as quickly as possible. Which brings us to the topic of cyber resilience. I think, uh, uh, as Jurgen highlighted, most organizations are reluctant to highlight when something has happened because of possibly you know, more business interruption threat because there are more bad actors will come flock to you if you highlight too early that you have vulnerability. There is obviously the reputation risk that is associated with any such cyber activity. But I will tell you the activity is rampant. There are thousands of organizations that get attacked and end up in some cyber scenario every year. And that's a large number. And I think the only way to get around it is both a long-term plan to re-architect your cybersecurity architecture to make sure you're getting more for less and that requires you to think about automation. It requires you to think about consolidating traditional strategies of using multiple vendors, using best of breed solutions from a lot of people and stitching it together is no longer working. And I think the report is a bit uh, sort of bifurcated on the idea of should we rely on in-house resources or go partner with third parties. I recommend work with specialists because this is what they do for a living. Uh, so in that context, I think it's encouraging. We have a lot of work to do. And I think we all need to aspire to make our organizations more cyber resilient. Thank you, Nikesh. Uh, Prime Minister Rama, we see this expectation uh, for a catastrophic cyber event from over 90% of leaders in the cyber sector. Albania was directly at the center of a cyber storm, if we may. What lessons can we take away uh, from that experience, particularly for political leaders? Thank you for, for having me here, and uh, I'll try to be helpful. Uh, first of all, uh, because of uh, the event you mentioned, we're obliged to start and learn more about it. And uh, one of the facts I learned is that uh, if cybercrime would be a state, would be the third global economy after US and China. In 2015, uh, the overall measure of uh, its, uh, its uh, power was 3 trillion. In 2025, this is forecasted to 10.5 trillion. So if we think uh, back in terms of uh, one virus, COVID-19, that created such a disruption, and uh, needed so much interaction and so much common efforts. Let's let imagine an exponential multitude of viruses that uh, mutate every day exponentially while uh, not uh, threatening our body but the bodies we live in, our organizations, our countries, our uh, systems, then, you know, it could be just apocalypse. And it's about, uh, uh, it's about viruses 
that can not only block our way of living, but can control it and can deviate it. So uh, can use our systems, like God forbid uh, our uh, air transport systems, to hit us back. And imagine if uh, there is a cyber attack on uh, our air transport systems that turn a huge number of airplanes that are flying in bombs. So um, what we learned is that this is something that uh, it's absolutely naive to think that every country being poor, being powerful or being not, being rich or being not, can take it in its own. Because uh, what we are seeing in uh, our daily struggle, we are under attack since last summer from Iran, and it's, it would be complicated for the audience to explain why, but we are under attack, and, would, and, and we have uh, coalized with a few other uh, friends, friendly countries that have the same, you know, uh, the same threat coming from the same source, and that are more developed than us in terms of uh, cyber defense, uh, that um, uh, weapons, if I can use this word, but because they are real weapons at the end, so logs and codes that are used to attack us represent for our allies uh, novelties. So it's also a way to learn what new weapons are being used in daily basis and to prepare against them. Uh, and I can't imagine how uh, the world, uh, I mean the, the institutional world, the um, organized world being in public sector or in private sector can survive it without a large, large, large coalition. So what we learned from the traditional crime in Europe is that traditional crime has created a much more functioning EU than the states because they are, they are uh, very much interconnected. They don't have uh, never-ending summits and, uh, and uh, meetings and they don't have vetoes to stop them from doing anything. In the meantime, that uh, the EU itself has to struggle to uh, create convergences and to create cohesion in common action. We saw it during pandemic. Uh, so, uh, uh, at the end, uh, there is also another thing. Uh, for the public sector, this is uh, really uh, challenging. On one hand, because it's a matter of resources. So, imagine Albania with its uh, GDP, with its development, uh, that has made uh, uh, an exponential step to turn from a country that was uh, very much based on uh, paper and on bureaucracies and on uh, bribes in a country that is today 95% of service online, which is the bless of technology for, for not uh, developed countries to make jumps that otherwise you would need decades, but at the same time is the curse of technology because you are totally exposed. And now we are exposed vis-à-vis -vis, uh, a power like Iran that, come on, it's not, it's not something we can match in terms of uh, finance, in terms of uh, uh, ruthlessness, in terms of uh, anti-democratic uh, uh, behavior and so on, to uh, now have to invest much more. So for the governments to invest in what will happen is one thing. But to invest in what should not happen is another thing. Because at the end, we have to, to, get, uh, to get elected, okay? So uh, China maybe has a much, uh, much more comfortable position because they can think quietly about the next 100 years. But if you have midterms, in Albania we don't, but uh, if you have midterms, you have to think about the next two years. And, uh, you know, and all the, all the, you know, chaotic uh, politics that uh, is uh, superposed to what is happening in the cyber, uh, 
crime world is very, very worrying. So uh, the question is how much the, the, the world will come together, how much the countries will come together, how much uh, big and small, rich and not so rich, will realize the need for each other. Because uh, if not for everything else, Albania now is a very important uh, laboratory to realize what's next. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I realize we start a few minutes late, so if the panelists will give a few extra minutes, I know we probably have some questions from the journalists in the room. Um, if you can identify your organization, uh, your question, and uh, also who you'd like to direct the question to. Uh, thank you all. I'm Fabrizio Goria from the Italian Daily La Stampa, and um, I have a question for Mr. Stuck. Uh, as you know, um, one of the most wanted mafia mobster, Mattia Messina De Naro, was caught, and uh, now he's in custody. And as you know, the mafia was uh, updating itself uh, to the cyber crime. The, can we consider this capture as a success or as a, as a win? for the Eurozone and Europe. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, it, it's definitely a, a great success um, after having been for, I think, 30 years on the run. Um, and uh, we, we get insights now on how intensive uh, investigations have been definitely a success. We are very grateful to the Italian government. They are supporting a project within Interpol that is called ICANN, that is targeting Drangheta primarily. And we know this is an example for a very dynamic group that is using every risk that we are discussing here in the context of risk as an opportunity for criminal activity to become richer. Thanks to that work and Interpol providing a platform for all those countries that have identified Tangeta as a problem, we are able to provide analysis that leads to investigative leads that have also led to a significant number of other arrests and even um, providing some countries with the information who have not yet been aware that they are having a problem with organized crime, Italian organized crime or other organized crime. So definitely a success and a role model for the need to provide a global platform like Interpol that helps collecting all the intelligence that is available and translating that into investigative leads that lead to arrests and the seizure of, of the illicit procedure of crime. We know the optimists are saying around 2 to 3 percent of all the I think the two trillion that are every year um, laundered through the, uh, through the uh, legitimate economy, the financial system, are being seized by law enforcement, prosecutors, police and, and courts at the end of the day. The pessimists are saying less than 1%. So we know we have to do a lot more to get uh, behind the money that they are making. And as the Prime Minister said, these groups that are developing hacking tools are incredibly rich. We, we have no idea how much hundreds of millions or even billions they have made during the last couple of years with these ransomware attacks and with ransoms that have been paid. It's a huge challenge for us and that perhaps requires a reconsideration also of political priorities to put more resources. You mentioned, um, Jeremy, cybersecurity shortage. That is a big problem for, for a lot of Interpol member countries. Great, thank you. A uh, question here in the corner. Yeah, good morning to all. I'm Fabrice Nodelonglois from the French newspaper Le Figaro. My question is for uh, Eddie Rama. Uh, bonjour, Eddie. Um, can you share with us, for those who have not followed too closely the, the attacks, some of the very uh, concrete uh, impact that your, your country um, uh, experienced and what were the, your quickest response? What, what were you able to do? I avoided in the introduction, <coughs> introduction because it would be uh, complicated uh, for, for, for the time we have in our disposal. In Davos, you can be late in starting, but you cannot be late in ending <laughs> because others have to get the room. Uh, so uh, I'll try to be uh, as synthetic as possible. So w what we have done, uh, it's uh, that we have uh, um, considered the technology as our safe uh, saving boat to get from a uh, level of uh, administration that was very much uh, contaminated by, uh, by endemic uh, corruption in terms of bribery to a level where uh, the direct contact between uh, citizens and uh, ser public servants and uh, offices was eliminated through, uh, through online interaction. So we succeeded to 
become from a country that was uh, was really in in the ditch in these terms in a country that is today uh, eighth in Europe and uh, somewhere between 16 and 17 worldwide based on the UN chart in terms of uh, digital public services and it's exactly where uh, where the attackers aimed to 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 hurt us by uh, practically uh, uh, aiming to wipe out completely our digital infrastructure and to completely uh, erase our data in terms of uh, public uh, services it was very very disturbing because for for several weeks we had to it was like an incredible uh, war happening uh, in the in the web uh, 24 7 many people engaged in the trenches to uh, push back and uh, we succeeded practically to survive this attack uh, by not uh, letting uh, letting them uh, do uh, what they were supposed to do and then uh, through a very very thorough forensic that we did uh, together with microsoft uh, threat intelligence team and uh, uh, red team of FBI and several others, we arrived in the conclusion that uh, it was absolutely clear that behind this attack was uh, was a state, and namely Iran. So we attributed it to Iran based on facts, not just on uh, on. And uh, what is uh, what is the other side of uh, of the scary, uh, you know, scary. Uh, uh, presence in our lives of cybercrime is that it's not like uh, entering uh, in your house. It's not like breaking your house that you have the door broken or you have the window broken and uh, they enter. They can be in your house and you don't know they are in your house. So it's, uh, it's penetrations uh, and uh, in the same time is like ticking bombs, you know, programming the day and the moment that the bomb will blow. Until then, you may not be aware at all that you are uh, you are sleeping uh, on a bomb, and uh, what we are doing today, as I said, with our uh, two other friendly countries, uh, is exactly that, uh, and we are detecting, thanks to also their uh, much uh, higher expertise, we are detecting exactly what are the movements in the dark that otherwise no one. Would be aware of, and uh, we are very much, uh, uh, very much preoccupied uh, to to raise the, 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 the awareness on the private sector about the danger, and to make the private sector enter in uh, cooperation and in interaction with the government, also in terms of contributions. So uh, it's not it's not at all an easy exercise, but. Uh, it's the new world, so uh, I hope uh, the prophetic, uh, the prophetic uh, sentence of Michel Rocard will not uh, prove uh, itself to be to be true in the in the in the long run. When he, before dying, he said, "I'm very, very. Uh, I feel blessed that I was. Uh, I lived in the time internet was born." And I feel blessed that I'm leaving this world before before internet will destroy it. Good. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'm going to actually uh, also, the Prime Minister mentioned the need to uh, stay on a schedule here. Uh, we are in Switzerland. After all, uh, if you have questions, uh, further questions, I recommend to see if any of the panelists are available following the session here. Um, I'd like to thank our collaborators uh, for their support, uh, both Accenture for the work directly on the report, uh, Palo Alto Networks for the uh, broader support of the Center for Cybersecurity at the World Economic Forum, our partnership with uh, Interpol, and also the Prime Minister for his uh, participation participation and sharing uh, the experience here today. I uh, welcome everyone to go more depth. The report will now be available online. And uh, thank you for joining us here today.